Welcome to another episode of HBCU Digest, Digest After Dark on Sirius XM 142 HBCU, the pride of Howard University. I am your hostess, Tiffany, and obviously I am permanently on the roll. These are my hits and Jared is on vacation for the foreseeable future. So tonight we are joined by the regular daddies, Laurel the Aggie, Midnight Winston, getting, getting them into school, Orz the Morganite, and KD from Coppin. What up, though? It's lit. These are my hits once again. So, guys, gals, friends, family, how are y'all feeling tonight? Now that I'm in charge. We in the game, baby. That's it? That's Nothing it. else? Race for impacts. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, you're on mute, ma'am. She won't even. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's still a wet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> she won't even. Oh, yes. hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's still a wet. No, can you turn your head again, please? That's nice. <laughs> the shape of it. That's nice. I'm sorry. I am mildly jealous. I can't get my bush to do that. It's too. Okay. Crazy. All right, so if you all don't have anything else to say before we get started, we can just get started. So um, late last week, we all learned that um, the Lincoln University of Missouri, their president was having these problems with their board. Um, That was the first story that came out from Digest in, in the briefing. And then literally maybe, maybe two days later, definitely by the end of the week, Um, We were seeing that their athletic director, former athletic director, or maybe he still is the athletic director, is now their interim president. Um, And I know I had a lot of quick thoughts when I saw this. And obviously, here's Jared saying uh, this piece of news. Um, It then uh, came out shortly thereafter in a story on multiple sites and definitely on the digest that he is in fact their interim president. So I know of course what I thought, but really quickly want to get your thoughts um, on this. I know that as somebody who works in higher ed, who has served on um, a committee that was looking for a provost and vice president of uh, academic affairs, I was like, Where's their provost? Was uh, John Mosley the most qualified person? Was he the true number two person to lead the institution? Where is their executive vice president? And again, is he the real number two? Like, what is what is the original succession plan in case a president becomes not the president anymore? Right. Um, Still do not have answers to those questions because I definitely went to their website and went to their provost's page and I did not find a provost. Um, So I'm throwing it to Laurel first. Laurel, ma'am, please tell me something. Well, you know, HBCU websites are not known for their brevity or UX design, but (laughs) that's not the topic today. Um, I mean, I looked at what I could of his resume. And so I think on its face, it looks like, okay, why did they just pull this random white man? And so he's still very much a random white man, but at least he's a random white man with higher ed admin experience. And he has the degree to back it up because we know people care about degrees. So I feel like on paper, he does qualify. I know people get bristled when they see a white person in leadership at a historically black college. I just feel like, I mean, I also question like, okay, if he was the best possible option, what all, what all, who is, who's all there at Lincoln (laughs) and and what's going on? Like, does someone really have something that they were going to be put on a summer jam screen for if they got selected and they said, oh, nah, like, let's go with him just to be safe. Don't know. Um, Could be worse. It really could be worse. worse. But there was an article that Jared dropped in, in the chat. Um, and in this article, the only thing that I really, really remember from it is that he didn't intend to be at Lincoln as a permanent administrator. He did not originally want to be one. So what changed to make him 
decide, oh, I seriously want to be here as an administrator. And then is that enough to, to make anyone, whether it's him or somebody else, say, oh, I can do this enough. I want this enough to enough to be the president if it comes to that. Like, I think I wouldn't be as hesitant if I didn't read that he said that when he was first hired at Lincoln. So it could be worse. Winston? To, to Laurel's point, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like we, we see a face, a certain face that gets put in, in these roles at an HBCU and it kind of, you know, brings about like these buzzes or like these concerns. Um, I don't know enough about the, the man's track record other than him being an athletic director. And I didn't, I'm not privy to the, to what the one you just talked article or information we're just talking about. So, um, you know, it looks, it don't look good. You know what I'm saying? The optics are questionable at the very least. The optics are questionable. Um, you know, then there was a picture that was floating around social media and he has a, uh, a, a multiracial family, uh, which, you know, I guess adds, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of credibility to the idea of him in that role at an HBCU. I mean, it just, you know, it just looks funny. I don't know. I don't know the legitimacy behind it, but it's just, it just looked questionable, man. It just got, you got questions like some smell funny, like, you know, on Dre Row, we say it just, it kind of looked funny. Like, I don't know what it is or what it's, what it's not, but it just doesn't seem like to you, to the points that have been made. Was there nobody else? Is You know, what is, what does succession plan look like to, to Laurel's point? Does somebody have something on somebody that, that they weren't able to, or that he got bumped up to that role? I, I don't know. Yes. And like, if, if he was, if he was most qualified, why was he just the athletic director? Why was he just the sports guy on all of this? I don't know. Katie, are you are you together enough to give yours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so reading as much as you could possibly read about this story, because there is not much. The thing that stood out to me in the letter that Lincoln published is that he's a um, great fundraiser. Family man too, but a great fundraiser. And that's largely why he got the job. Um, it's because he knows how to raise money. Um, whatever success he had is probably what kept him there, point blank period. I mean, I don't know how it's the frame. It's, you know, I've stepped into jobs where I'm like, man, I don't know if I'm feeling it here. And then I get to know the people and I get to know the population. And it's like, all right, I'll stay for a while, right? Until something better comes along. And remember, this is just interim. Now, could it turn into permanent? Yes, but does that normally happen? No, but if they feel like the random white man is the <laughs> best option right now, then we just gonna have to live with that because we're not in control of these boards. These boards clearly don't care what the community thinks. I think you can go now all 100, and we may have some input, but by and large, they do whatever they want to do, right? And this board is no different. So if they feel like the random white man is the best person for this place and time, we got to ride with it, especially given we don't know Missouri politics. And so we don't know what other obstacles could be in place with the wrong hire. And maybe he's able to cut through in a way that the tenured black professors or the tenured black presidents can't at this point um, in their stage of leadership. You said something that, and it only makes me circle back to asking, where is their provost? Because <laughs> no, 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 no. A provost also should be raising money to establish new programs and to fund programs. So that person has to be a good fundraiser too. So again, where is the provost? Like where? Where is the provost? I don't know. Or you got it. So I think that one thing that I noticed and I looked at is you have to remember that Lincoln is a public land grant school um, in the state of Missouri. And obviously Missouri does have two very large black populations in terms of people in St. Louis and, and in Kansas City. Um, so it does serve a, a purpose. And in some cases, I do tend to lean toward the idea that it's hard for black folks to get positions in leadership anywhere else. So we should have a monopoly on those at our HBCU now that we have them. I was to be all the history of, of Mordecai Johnson and so forth and so on. And, and the leadership change that went from 
white folks leading the schools to then black people. And then we've had a monopoly on our space. So I don't like seeing um, an opportunity taken away from someone black because they're not going to get into a white school. Um, so a white person getting into a leadership at a black school always needs to feel like, uh, you know, are we doing enough? Because we don't, we only have so many jobs and they're not getting promoted at these um, predominantly white schools, especially in the Midwest. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I thought was, I think it shows a really interesting campus dynamic because if I worked in faculty, how would I respond to the leader being chosen as the athletic director? Faculty people have a very particular type of um, attitude towards non-clinicians, uh, people who have not um, sweated and toiled in the classroom or done research or done something That's in true. academia. And so even though he may have the credential in terms of a, uh, a doctor in education, he he one, 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 I feel like there's a, there's a hierarchy with PhDs, one, um, and then two, um, I don't know the the campus climate, but I can only imagine how some of the professors are probably taking this because again, it's just because again, usually you want to pick a dean, you pick a pro- I mean, sometimes you don't want to pick the provost because you want them to stay in that role to look over academic affairs. You usually want to pick somebody whose job is not as intensive, like a dean. A lot of times you see deans of business, deans of liberal arts, deans of sciences take an interim role because they can do both at the same time. Mm-hmm. And the provost can still run the operation to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. But I, I just thought all of it was weird. But then again, like Missouri higher ed is where we remember what happened with the Mizzou, Mizzou football team. And this is a public school. This is the same state board of education that had the same type of issues with the Missouri president leaving. Um, so, again, I don't put anything past it because the same people who put this board together at Lincoln put together that board at Mizzou and the issues they've had out there. So. I'm glad you brought up the board because I was thinking about the board um, and I think this goes back to I think something that Katie said a little earlier, but I went to go look for the board as well because who made this decision? The board did, obviously. So I wanted to know what the makeup was of the board um, and not trying to rely solely on identity uh, politics or symbolic um, representation, but the majority of this board um, is male. And then I was like, well, what type of men are these? Like, are they black men? Are they white men? Like, what, what is it? Um, so from what I could find, it is uh, an equal mix between black and white. There is one woman on the board. I, I didn't find a picture of her, so I, I don't know what she looks like, so I don't know. But what was interesting to me is that um, either one of their their board people, either he is a current judge or a retired judge, I think from memory, I think that's what it was. And I was just like, hmm, I wonder what the authority, like who holds the power on the board to influence a decision like this? Because did they really think that this was the way to go? And if they did not think that this was the way to go, could they say this is actually what we're not going to do? I don't know. I haven't seen anything outside of that. But that is what I have found and what I what I'm I'm still questioning again, how and why. Uh KD, you had something to say. What was it? Yeah, last thing. Um there were no PhDs around. I just thought about it. <laughs> He's an E D and no disrespect to that discipline, but yeah, in, in higher A tenured professors and tenured professionals probably should be in these roles. Nope. You can't get no, nope. and I'm going to tell you why. Oh. There are people that are scammers and charlatans that are currently running universities right now. There are people that are running their schools like Fortune 500 CEOs, and they're not running them into the ground. So I think, especially especially now with like COVID, like anything goes. And so the fact that he has a terminal degree that has a D on the end. Like, that's good enough. There's plenty of people that don't have tenure, haven't ever stepped in a classroom. They weren't even a TA and they were in the presidency because at that level, that's not really what matters. I mean, it helps. I'm not saying that, you know, if you taught, you should never be president. It's just not for that role. You need to know how to talk to people. You need to know how to, you need to, know how to raise money and you need to know how to stay out of the 10 o'clock news. So. If that's the case, then he does all of that. 
<laughs> he, he checks all and those boxes. And he for has sure. a complexion for the protection. For the and collection. On that, note, <laughs> on that note, we are moving on to our next topic because Laurel, you did it. Um, so obviously we have seen um, the American Rescue Act uh, and what it looks like um, for individuals with PPP and that whole situation, um, what it looks like for cities and municipalities and school districts. I, well, I know I've seen, but for those of you who may be unaware, um, everybody is getting his money. The monies are flowing um, because we are rescuing America. Um, and that means rescuing individuals with, like I said, giving PPP to business owners um, small businesses, large businesses, corporations, whatever the like, to cities. Um, and I mean by the millions. And there are uh, time constraints attached to uh, these these COVID relief funds. So the money has to get spent, right? So in our sector, what that looks like and what that means is that we get this money. There are HBCU grants that many schools um, are announcing that they've received and they're they're doing things with this money that they um, are going to receive or have already received from the federal government. And so late last week, I caught a story. Why are y'all laughing? Late last week, I caught a story. Um, here it is, where $84 million uh, has been secured by John Ossoff and Reverend Warnock um, for Georgia's HBCUs. This is a photo from uh, the, the press conference. This is the photo op. All of, or the majority of the HBCUs represented are HBCUs that have received funding from uh, the American Rescue Act. Um, one of these things is not like the other, in fact. So there's that, I will say that. Um, and so I am asking you all, uh, or is, you're going to be first, but asking you all, what might you want to see, um, of your HBCU or, or of the community in particular with this money? I know that, um, in this article in particular, they talk about how half of it for each institution, half of it must go to student scholarships. Okay. That's done. I get it. For any school that's in the AUC, that that is a big deal because they're very expensive to attend. But the other end of that money, the money that's in the free and clear that can go towards innovation, um, and whether that is tied to like institutional in innovation, so a solution or a special program or whatever, what might you want to see um, us do with this money or not us them well yes us us do with this money um to make it go further what what might you want to see or you're up i would say two things the first thing would be institutional infrastructure and the second thing would be um yeah pretty just infrastructure in terms of i think that one area where our schools have the ability to improve is with our processes um, in terms of admissions, in terms of financial aid, in terms of um, housing, just just basically, we still operate on very old systems, and I think that the issue is um, for some of these schools, you know, just an upgrade of systems can have a big impact on how well you run, how quickly you can report to DOE, um, how quickly you can get information out to um, to students to. Apply. And I think in all of these situations, that really is that should be the key focus. Um, I think also they could do some things to beautify. That, that's always that's always nice. But I think the biggest thing that already happened was getting the the debt forgiven. Um, so the schools are operating in a um, a period of of some positive cash flow for the first time and probably ever for some of these schools. Um, but I think it would be a gross um, misstep if they used it on marketing things of that nature. Um, because you can you can get some of that stuff organically. I think they need to spend their money on infrastructure and really work on campus Wi-Fi, work on the systems, work on the website, like work on all the things that you need to help pivot towards this new normal. Because we're not going back to the way it was, so you might as well invest in the way it's going to be. So, technology. Okay, Winston, as somebody who 
uh, like we all know, takes hundreds of kids year after year um, to a lot of different institutions and definitely to a, a fair few of HBCUs. Uh, as somebody who works closely with institutions that are not HBCUs, um, with institutions that have the funds to do a lot of things that we are just now probably going to crack into doing, what might you want to see? Yeah, um, well, first, let me just say how important, shout out Stacey Abrams, when you, when voting is. Like when you have people in the rooms and spaces that understand what needs to get done and are able to execute said needs and necessities, look at what happens. I just want to start off with that. For Shout out Georgia and Stacey Abrams. Um, and then as far as what we want to see, I think Orr is hitting on the nail for a lot of things. I mean, you know, simplistic, but but very vital, you know, things like having strong Wi-Fi, things that are going to attract the attention of a young person to particularly attend those institutions, because the reality is you're competing against not just HBCUs typically for our students, but, you know, but PWIs and large institutions, state funded institutions as well. So you have to be able to keep up with some of those um, those ancillary, those, um, you know, the physical things or things you're going to see um, or part of your experience at the institution for part of the infrastructure. That's definitely crucial. Um, I think some, some innovative ways to attract talent, like you, you know, you kind of alluded to, to me, you know, a lot of these uh, other institutions have the ability to have grants and funds in place to help students who are below socioeconomic backgrounds or, or issues, uh, you know, under those, those uh, umbrellas. So to be able to put together packages for those students, especially if you have a student who's already going to be full Pell pay Grant, which we're typically dealing with in, in the HBCU sector, being able to add monies on top of those students to make education more accessible um, to those young people, I think is, is, is critical and pivotal. And then the infrastructure piece, I think that plays the part for those students who maybe do come from a more um, beneficial background. And so if you have those those funds in place in general and you have you do those things, those amenities, um, those infrastructure things to be able to help attract some of them who maybe the other options they have, you know, have some of the shiny objects or those other things. So if you can do that and then you can also attack being innovative with scholarship options for um, students who are below certain thresholds. I think that's that's huge. That would be pivotal to be able to have um, more conversations and being able to present more of our options. And in this case, particularly look at, at what what's happening in, in Georgia, you know, Savannah State is one for me. I think it's a great option that's not talked about a lot. We've sent a few young people down there and, and they've had great experiences and got some great opportunities from that. So being able to infuse some money into a Savannah State um, or an Albany State, I think those are huge, um, you know, to be able to put them on the map and be more notoriety, potential to get more talented young people to come to those institutions. Um, but I'm excited. I mean, you know, it, it talked in the article also about access. And making these schools more accessible so i think that having these funds allows them to have to be in the conversation more which i think is an was an awesome is an awesome thing um as you were talking i, I was thinking about um the perfect balance or marriage between tradition and innovation um a lot of what makes our campus our campus is what they are and, and why they feel like home no matter where you go is the tradition that lives in the buildings. It's because they're so old. That is the spirit of the campus. So I think um, I think that's very important to say, to, to actually say and to name. I know that when the quad, as in the girls' residence hall, the traditional one at Howard, um, was being remodeled, we were like, that booty, ball, that booty wall better still be there. It better still be there. It still is there. I mean, it has a new... New face, new grill. It's it looks very nice, but we were all looking for the booty wall um, because tradition. So I just I had to say that. Uh, Katie, you're up. Um, so I read an article. I took it was a couple of takeaways I had. One, um, just thankful that some the students that are struggling um, to find monies to graduate will probably and finally get that opportunity and have that weight lifted off their shoulder. Kudos. Um, this is a big thank you from John Ossoff and um, uh, Representative Warnock for, um, you know, the HBCU community pushing them over the line in Georgia along with Stacey Abrams. Um, and so it was well deserved by all of the um, AUC and all of the pe all of the constituents in Atlanta that helped um, that uh, uh, um, attached to HBCUs. And so with that in mind, that elephant in the room with them two will always be um, we had to miracle work to get you in this position. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, 
with that in mind, I think some of this money, uh, not to say that anything y'all said has been wrong, because I definitely agree, right? Just put money into the campuses, make them beautiful, make the infrastructure better. All that is important. But some of this money needs to be spent to ensure that the contributions they make can continue to be made, especially given that Georgia, with Georgia and their voice suppression um, and the nasty laws that have been passed recently, it would behoove universities to at least mobilize their political science units, their criminal justice units, um, so in a way that they can still affect change on the ground in coming years. Um, <clears throat> that's just me being creative um, with the spend. You have this excess money that came from the government. Let's kick it back into the system to make sure that we can continue to get money. Right. And it doesn't have to be a lot either. It could be the smallest contribution you could possibly make, but it'd be more than enough to keep that engine going. Because again, you don't want it just to be this one flash, right? You want continuous funds over the over you know, the coming years. Definitely. Laura. I'd say beyond everything else everyone has already said, I think I don't know. I feel like the government gave us money. That doesn't mean we need to kick it back to them because they already get that every April 15th. <laughs> so they don't need any more. They're fine. But I think that same money can be diverted to creating programming for institutions that don't already have, whether at all graduate programs or enough graduate programs, graduate programs that are competitive, mm -hmm. um, programs that are unique. Um, even though we're talking about Georgia, I can name off the top of my head like a few programs that I only know about just because I look up everything and I just know things that outside of that area, I know nobody knows that they're there. Like the nuclear engineering program at, I wanna say South Carolina State, things like that. And so bolstering those programs because like a and for example, we get a lot of money, government and non, that just all goes to engineering everything. And so it's like, what would that be like at other schools like Eastern Shore with their aerospace and um, pilot programming and things like that, that you already have a good foundation who else is going to come to the Eastern Shore, let's be honest, and putting money into that. And another program that I know some schools have, they just market them poorly, more, pro more money for programs that bring back returning students from people who started at the school in 1985 and had a good two semesters, but then they had to drop out and they ain't been back in 30 some years and allows them to come back with them same credits and finally get their bachelor's degree. Because overall in higher ed, there are more and more students that are non-traditional that are adult uh, continuing education students. And you need to speak to them, too. Everybody's not coming in straight out of high school and they're 18 years old. There are a lot of people that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s that are getting more degrees, trying to finish the first degree they started. And I feel like HBCUs already reached those students at that age already. So why not just build on that with an older age base? That is a really, a really great point. Um, that actually puts us right on time in time for our third, um, our third segment. And I was, I was thinking that somebody else was going to hint at it. You all hinted around it for the most part, but um, obviously we all are aware that uh, Nicole Hannah did not receive or did not receive tenure from UNC. Um, she definitely more than earned it, of course. Uh, but so she is the latest black scholar to be denied tenure at her institution. Um, and in seeing that, of course, not surprised at all, but I was, unfortunately, this is what, this is the first thing that came to mind, but um, I was reminded of that one clip from early on in Donald Trump's presidency, or maybe it was when he was still camp, uh, campaigning, but he was just like, to Black people, what do you have to lose? And so in my mind, um, when I saw this story about Nicole Hanna, um, and I then thought about Cornel West fighting for the same thing, I'm just like, what do y'all have to lose? Because you, you can't lose your tenure because tenure, tenure, you don't have it. Um, so why are you still there? 
Um, so that is what I what I what I thought, what I've been thinking about. And at this point, given that we we as in our institutions have or will receive monies that we didn't know that we would receive. So we have an excess of funds, like Katie said earlier. Um, we now have money to do things that we probably didn't think that we could do before. Um, and so I was thinking that, you know, this is high time, right on time to start snatching black scholars. Hey, come over here, do what you were doing there, but here, oh, and we'll give you ten tenure, right? So um, in my head, because I am a millennial, um, I think like everybody else on here, maybe not Winston, hold the line. Um, this is actually what I was thinking about when I uh, made what I'm about to show you all next. But Jared obviously shared the story. I said, oh, this is the one. Um, so obviously he outlines Morgan, Howard, a and fam. You will a and was a waste of time. I don't mean to cut you off. The same board that denied her at UNC ain't gonna let her go to a &T. Okay, first of all, let me finish my point. How you gonna cut off the hostess? Just did. I will throw you back. <sighs> or please don't act like you don't know me. All yeah, right. Oh, Riff Raff backstage. Oh, That's why you don't mention a &T, cause a and because a minds their business. Okay, you got, some beef. <laughs> you got some beef. You better pop that to Howard. Don't be okay. talking. All right, back to the point that I was making before Oris interrupted. Oris. As I was saying, as you can see, maybe you can't see, but Wilbur Sart said, deadest of asses. This would be a cool for all of y'all. And it would be. Um, and so in true millennial fashion, I was thinking about um, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and how they would all come together and form one big Megazord. And so I did just that because that's what I was thinking about. Um, and for those of you who are not millennials, who have not seen, not nary a Power Rangers, anything, who maybe are not parents of millennials or grandparents of millennials, this is a Megazord. And so as you can see, <laughs> I'm looking at y'all backstage. Y'all are hilarious. As you can see, um, Howard is at the top because it is lonely at the top. You will see fam as the striker because striker, strike again. Um, a and as the foot. Uh, that just made sense to me to put there. Um, and then Morgan because that's all I could think of, honestly, because bears, scratch, whatever. Um, and then as the wild card, I just picked the old school Hampton Pirate. Um, I don't really have... A reason for that. But anyways, so that's what I was thinking about. So um, I would say or ask of you all and I will bring Oris back after he's done with his his bed in the green room. Um, <laughs> what do you all think about this this idea, this concept of, yes, of course, we have this money, we will have this money, but ensuring that we create things that aren't, create experiences, fund experiences, educational experiences through these scholars where we're creating something that we are getting a return on because we're educating our people. We're giving them something that, or not our people, but our students, we're giving them something that they wouldn't get elsewhere. So we're working with them to create um, something through black scholars like Nicole Hanna or and, and other black scholars who've been denied tenure at their uh, traditionally white institutions. So Laurel, gonna start with you. This whole situation is ashy, but expected. I mean, it's Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill charges their own students $75 a piece just to go to the basketball game. So you gotta fight out alumni and all them old white people just to go to your own school's game. That's very ghetto. Um, I think it was a long, it wasn't really a long way coming. If you, I follow her on Twitter. So like I've seen everything I, Wales, right? before she even wrote the 1619 project. So I, I saw this coming, but I think with, I mean, at least for her, she is an alum that makes it even more like, wow, y'all are like, we knew y'all were racist, but y'all really just, y'all don't care no more. I think for her and other public intellectuals, 
regardless of where they were educated, I think scholars have a tendency to not just chase the money, but chase the prestige. So that even if a school like Harvard, um, that has the largest endowment in the entire country, possibly the world, but country, um, will literally hand you a piece of toilet paper with shit on it and you will take it gladly. And that's essentially what people do. And they'll say, here's a crumb, even though you've literally written all the key books in your field, you are an expert of experts. Here's this little piece of dirty toilet paper. And you're gonna take it because it has Harvard's brand on it. And so I think with HBCUs, we may not all have as much to offer in terms of dollars and prestige, but it comes, I think it just comes down to like when you go to sleep at night, do you like who you are? Because it's very those those same, we we all know, we all get in the same rooms. I just have less school debt than you do. So it's like, you know, for a lot of people, even if they're being shit on, they're still going to take it because, oh, it's Harvard. Or, oh, it's Princeton. Oh, it's, you know, oh, it's Duke. Oh, this is the R1 University. I'm going to be, I'm going to be world renowned. It's a lot easier to just follow in the same overly tread path and then to create a new one with an institution where it's going to be a bigger risk. It's going to look more unique. You don't really know where it's going to go. You don't know what you're going to be able to do. But I think a lot, a lot of people just go with what they know, even if what they know is racist, is selling out. So, I mean, like with the Cornell West situation, I was like, yeah, you did all this stuff. You were also an alum. And they were just like, nah. And so you're leaving in a huff, but what is, that doesn't change them because they'll just get somebody else and they'll make a new Cornell West or what's his face? What's that man that be, you know, grabbing all women even though he married and had to- uh, We're not going there. We not are though. We are, no, we no, are. And I have a point, no, I have a point. Now this is not about womanizing men and scholarship because that is an entirely different podcast. Mm -hmm. But people like him. He got yes. he got run out of Georgetown and he still got a job at Vanderbilt. So it's just like, you know, he's not at uh -huh. HBCU either. Oh, and y'all can Google it later because I'm not lying. I don't tell lies. But I just think that there's on the side of the intellectual, at the end of the day, it's like, what do you what do you want your work to speak to? Who do you want to speak to? What do you want your legacy to be? What do you want your legacy to be? Because you can't keep you know, it's like going to McDonald's and crying that they don't have no veggie burger. It's like you're at McDonald's. McDonald's doesn't sell meat. We don't know what they sell. We know there's an animal byproduct. I don't know which one, but it's like you know what you're getting each mm -hmm. time and it's not going to change. So it's like outside of like their whole situation with the board, which is also trash because they only have two women on a 12 person board. Only one of them is black. Don't know her, don't want to say anything about her, but it's like, you know, and everybody else is a white man. Only one of them is young, everybody else old white men. So it's like, and then they're in the pocket of the NCGOP. So it's like, you have all of these things and people were saying, oh, what does this say about, you know, politics infecting public higher ed? And I'm like, they already have, that's how this whole thing started from the beginning. So it's like, you can't, Unless you want to start a new ICDC college and run with it, it's it's not it's not going to change. <laughs> so I think I think for those intellectuals and anybody that's in the pipeline that wants to be the next Nicole Hannah Jones or we don't need another Cornell West, but in that same vein, they really have to ask themselves, okay, whatever my field is, what do I want to do with this? Do I just want to write books and collect a check? maybe do an appearance at Jamal Bryant's church and call it a day? Or do I actually want to enact change, whether you know my name, whether I'm a household name or not? That's what people got to ask themselves. Because I feel like if you want to be the Jimmy Swaggart of scholars, just I would rather you just own it and go on about your business. You made a point about um, them being there and accepting this treatment, even though we know what traditionally white institutions do and what they mean to black people. And so in my mind, if you did it once, you can do it again. Like it's not the institution that has made you 
the scholar, not that institution in particular, what I should say. For Cornell West, if he's, or him being an alum, all right, you got a little bit, but like, Everybody isn't in everybody who works as a professor at an institution is not necessarily an alum of the institution, right? So if it didn't make you don't feel like you have some, or maybe some people do, I don't feel any ownership of Michigan. I don't feel any ownership of state. I don't feel any ownership for any traditionally white institution. Maybe there are some black people who do, but not me. And so maybe that's what they feel. They feel an ownership of, I don't know how, but maybe that's what it is. And that's what keeps them working or wanting tenure at a traditionally white institution. I that that could be it. I'm gonna go to Winston. <laughs> Winston. So first off, the, the the amount of disrespect. Am I a millennial or not? How old do you think I am, my G? Like that's why. I don't know. Okay, so backstory for everybody. <laughs> Winston's grandmother and my grandmother were friends. So Winston, all I know is maybe the same age as my oldest cousin, but I kind of don't know how old he is. So I don't know. I'm a millennial, dog. That's really just. I'm sorry. Wow. Dang. All right. Sorry. Go, go on. Go ahead. Um. Yeah. No. I told y'all to let Laurel loose, and we could really have a time. And you should have done it earlier. But, but, but I digress. Here we are. Um. You know uh, the the so the the praise from the article, the know know your place aggression. I'm using that going forward. I think that's a a perfect description of what they put this amazingly brilliant talented sister in a space of and and to laurel's point some of it probably voluntarily um you know alma mater or not you got to know what you're getting into and you know what you're getting into at unc chapel hill it's no different than university of michigan and other schools that we can name um who who treat the same thing and say you know you can take this getting spit on and um being called out your name and just so you can say that you you can say go blue uh one day or uh something along those lines. So, you know, we got to have real conversation about loving yourself, about loving, being okay, embracing being black and things that are black and not thinking of them as beneath just because they are that, um, you know, cause the reality is we talk to the kids all the time. I'll put my, you know, Philander Smith, my Talladega college, my Harris Stowe students against your best U of M student um, and watch them, wash them because they've been poured into, they've got resources and opportunities um, that have fed them to be successful. So, you know, you you feeding this idea about your really good branding and your funds to be able to sell your brand does not equate you being at a better institution or having better resources or opportunities. You know what I'm if FERPA wasn't a thing, we could name these students. No, Please leave. Winston and I, I could name these students. If yeah, not, yeah. thing, we could name them. No, and yeah, I could give you names. Yeah. I'll, I'll just name their schools. I'll just say the schools and then, you know, the counter schools or whatever. Now, just 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 to put it out there. But but in reality, you know, it's unfortunate. The situation the situation is unfortunate, but it is a real it's a reality check for everybody. And to your point, hopefully it is enough. So for people to consider, um, you know, the why you might want to come on home and why, why what's the value in, in coming on home, especially right now, because the iron is hot. So, you know, it's a buzzwords about diversity and inclusion and HBCUs are at the top of the conversation. There's not a better time for you to come home um, and really show what it is than right now. It, the, 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 the iron is hot. You know what I'm saying? So you might as well get your clothes down and and get the, get them boys straight because that's where we are right now. Um, and, you know, I, I just I think it's uh, just a reality check. Like I said, it's nothing new. It's nothing none of us already knew about UNC Chapel Hill. It's just now it's in the forefront. Now everybody can see it and it's plain. But but the reality is we know it was there. And it's not just UNC Chapel Hill. It's a bunch of other schools we can name um, that, to Laurel's point, will take boo-boo on a stick and be like, oh, I'm glad that it's your boo-boo and, you know, and I'll take it, as opposed to being celebrated. And it's no different than these kids. Yikes. Winston has dropped off. He'll be back, though. He'll be back. <laughs> KD, you're up. Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> um, bring him back. Is he back? Hold on, his eyes are moving now. Hold on. <laughs> Winston, you're back. My bad. Internet is unloyal. 
<laughs> what were you what were you about to finish saying? No, I was just saying, you know, the kid, these students are no different than the professors chasing clout. And it just has to come to reality to understand exactly what it is, to Laura's point. Like, stop chasing these names in the clout and go where you're celebrated and you have real opportunity. That's what it, that's all that matters at the end of the day. Absolutely. Uh KD, you got it. Man, um, listening to y'all, I overthought this entire situation, right? Because I, I watch and read too much, too many current events from time to time. And so if you've been paying attention to political Twitter and political, well, actually the political space in general, as it relates to education right now, the GOP is uh, feverishly fighting back um, this idea of studying critical race theory. <laughs> and so oh, we're you gonna get to that at some point. <laughs> and so if you don't know what it is, because uh, it's very complex, but it's the intersection between race and law and how pretty much laws are racist in this country and how it affects racial um, interactions throughout the nation. But it's really only studied by either law students or like really in depth criminal justice political science students. It's not something that's broadly covered. It's not in high school. I teach in high school. Critical race theory never comes up as a subject of or topic of conversation in the social studies department. I can guarantee because it's entirely too complex. And so since she was a part of the 1619 project, I thought this was just them punishing her saying, hey, you wrote this uh, anti-American part of the show. Yeah, this anti-American document. Yeah. Um, there's no way that we can put you on a pedestal um, for you to continue to write anti-American documents. Um, like the 1619 Project. Um, but it might be more primitive than that. She's black. She's woman. Um, she will probably be leapfrogging a lot of white men who probably did not earn their positions anyway. Um, yeah, right? She's brilliant. Um, and, and and she's good. And, and, white, and point blank period, white men are intimidated by black women that are good at their jobs. It scares them for whatever reason. Um, and it's just so unfortunate that she doesn't want to find a home at another, at least at this point, that she doesn't want to find a home at another HBCU. I say since she doesn't have tenure, I was I would still be looking for a job because that I mean, at the, when we talk about budget cuts, the untenured faculty go first. And who knows how long this money is going to be floating around, even though I know UNC is good. I know they got in downs for days, but still, when they want to fire people, they attack the untenured people first. So if I was her, I'm still looking for a job and I'm going wherever I can find some tenure. But if that's not where her heart is, um, sorry, I don't know. You, you know, at some point you got to value yourself more than the system. And it seems like she just values the system a little more than herself. And then for what reason, I do not know. You're muted, sweetie. <laughs> I don't know if I can fully agree with that only because we would be expecting her to do what others have not done. Like Laurel just talked about a well-known yeah. black scholar who went from Georgetown to Vanderbilt. My man yeah, did not yeah. go to what, wait, what HBCU is in? Is in yeah. it is Vandy? Is it? So Fisk, Fisk and Tennessee. Tennessee. We didn't go there. So, so why? I'm not saying it just as an attack on her, or just as I, a, I know, but I I still have to point out that we would be putting a lot on this one black woman who has to be a black woman scholar in a white system. What's new? Let me. Just, can I? What's new? What's new? No, like, black I, women in general in this country. I get it. Somebody got to take the first step, but always. Putting it on the black woman to take the first. She step. wrote the sixteen nineteen project. Okay, she did yeah. get thick skin at this point. So, yes. We're already doing that. Just by you being count on black women. women, you can always count on black women. But for just this, part, I need to see somebody else. Just by being in academia, it's already hard as hell being a black woman. Check Nikki Giovanni, who has her doctorate, and how many years at Virginia Tech that she told them about the student that eventually became the VTech shooter. And she told them to watch him and yeah, this is what he's turning into me. Y'all need to look and they were like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And she was already Nikki Giovanni at this point. Mm -hmm. And so like, as a black woman in and outside of academia, you are getting it from everybody. You're getting it from white people. You're getting it from black men. You're getting mm -hmm. it from people with other marginalized identities, whether you have other intersecting marginalized identities on top of already being black women. So 
I'm not putting that on her. She already wrote the 1619 project. To me, she good on black forever. Like her ticket is paid. But I think it's just it speaks to a larger conversation of other scholars, those who are household names and those who are not, but are doing equally important, impactful work that is impacting policy and all these other things that in in getting, you know, getting called for documentaries like that one woman who shall not be named. <laughs> that likes to lust after other people's husbands named John Legend. Um, actually, she wouldn't, cause this would be a different chair, but maybe she should have the Samuel H. Proctor chair. Just a thought. Because if, if, if follow, my, follow my train of thinking, since there's so many white schools that seem to have African and Afro-American centers, programs, colleges, et cetera, et cetera, on their campuses have uh, chairs, tenure chairs, research chairs, research grants, um, pipeline programs, then that is the only way that I would accept a black scholar to be at a white school is if you're leading those departments. Because I know there's at least one that's led by some old white man. And then they need to, then they also need to pay it forward and then either construct a pipeline that works in conjunction with Moreland Spingarn. Okay. Or any other um, university that may not have a robust archive or library system, but say, here, hi, I'm Yale. Look at all this material and resources that I have. We're gonna establish an agreement and we're just gonna do a memorandum of understanding. And any student that is affiliated with your campus, undergrad to grad and postgrad, has access to our resources thanks to this agreement. That's easy as hell to do because they do it every day with insert sport here. So they could do it. Even if it's not the moving of individuals, there needs to be moving of some feet and some dollars because it doesn't make sense that the same asshole schools that was, you know, once upon a time selling Negroes to okay. keep the on. And that's how you got all your money in your endowment because you were not paying for labor. Yikes. Selling Negroes to keep the lights on at a school funded by the Catholic Church. Amen. Praise Jesus. It does not make sense to know that that's your history and talking about, OK, we're done. That's our reparations. Oh, no, it has not even begun to be done. And so you know, people say, oh, well, should we just get rid of these institutions? I'm like, no, because they have they will have to pay those rep reparations forever until time ends. They will have to be doing that, whether it's through institutions or individuals. I think it's on individuals to start the wave. I don't think those individuals should be black women first. They can be like fifth. Um, black men can be first, um, but it needs to be. It can't just be her because I feel like it's. I feel like she's the easy target because you know the news is focusing on her right now. Her name is always going to be attached to the sixteen nineteen project, which is still active. It's ongoing. I don't think that's fair to put all that pressure on her. And at the end of the day, she's still an alum of Chapel Hill. So even if she decides to walk away from them forever, she still has beef with them and that's her business. But anyone else, especially people that are still coming up, they haven't even, you know, they are ABD. Those are the people that is really gonna be on to say, okay, now that you're out, what you gonna do? Are you gonna stay at this school that you're at? Cause just cause you got your degree from like Boston University or Boston College doesn't mean you have to stay there because people have money. Or, or you can apply for a grant and take that money with you and say, hey, here's me with all this money. This is the work I'm trying to do. What's up? Where my, where, you got office space? And depending on the school and the environment, they'll do it if they're smart. Um, and now we will allow Ors to have his say. Um, Ors? I'm going to be uh, brief. The first oh. thing is that... Um, I think that we don't, we don't have many like people who are active creatives who are on faculty at HBCU. So I know MK Asante is at Morgan. Um, I know we, we have had people in the past at the other schools. TSU's had a couple people like Robert Bullard and different people who have been kind of active in their their field while teaching, quote unquote. But I think as Jared would always say, we don't have the money at most schools to have faculty on payroll who are teaching one creative writing class or so forth and so on. 
or who are flying in, you know, for a, a month and then flying back to New York or wherever they do their business. Because usually faculty HBCUs have five or six classes, graduate and undergraduate, um, depending on the, the program. The second thing I think is that I don't want these people at our schools, to be quite frank. I don't want, you know, the person from Detroit who got who left Georgetown at, at, at Fisk. I don't want the person, you know, from, you know, from Sacramento who, who been at Princeton the other school. I don't want him at, at, at Howard and Morgan. I think that we as schools and, and one of my alma maters, presidents does a lot of offering people jobs, you know, offering the Austin Poet Laureate jobs, to people who spoke at the inauguration for one poem. It's like, I don't, I don't want cool. And I say that because I want people who are dedicated to the mission of our institution, which is getting the students ready to where we got to go. I don't care about the the notoriety because at the end of the day, you know, it, this is no different than the young man who well, he ain't young no more, but the man who's out in Jackson, Mississippi, this is no different than what's going on right now in Nashville, which is that we make decisions for marketing, but it doesn't help the students. Like I would love to see the, the graduation rates at Jackson State. I'd love to see the job placement rates for those students after they finish their time and he's transitioned to an FBS job, which is what he wants in the first place. So uh, I'm just, I'm not a big fan of going for big names because that's, that's not that's not our mission. If our mission is to help black people, then our mission needs to be focused on that. And quite frankly, she don't help nobody. And no offense to her, but you know, she's even spoken about how you know she was raised by you know her her parents one parent is black one parent is white she went to notre dame and then went to union c for grad school she her her journey to get to this point was a personal journey for herself so maybe she can finish that at hbcu but i don't think it's i think it'd be about her look searching out for us and the same way she searched out for 60 for the 1619 project in terms of us as well i don't want us like i said to end I don't want us going after these big names solely for the fact of having them on staff because I don't think it, it serves us. And quite frankly, a lot of these people, man, are rude and they're, they're assholes and they only care about themselves. They're self-serving, they're egotistical, and they think that they shit don't stink. And quite frankly, they're going to run up to a night class at Morgan or at Coppin or at TSU and deal with somebody who, who fresh off of living in the projects who ain't got time for that attitude. So that uh, concludes our uh, Digest After Dark episode for this evening on Sirius XM Channel 142 HBCU, the pride of Howard University. Again, I am your hostess, Tiffany, um, for the foreseeable future because Jared is, in fact, on vacation and I am permanently on the road. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Um, and that'll do it. <laughs>